Outside Margaret Thatcher's London residence, a steady stream of well-wishers have been paying their respects with bouquets of flowers. The inscriptions on the cards, wholehearted tributes to her impact as Britain's first woman Prime Minister. The common threat that Margaret Thatcher made Britain great again. In her hometown of Grantham, the local museum has an exhibit dedicated to the borough's most famous daughter. In terms of you know, a local girl who grew up here, born above a grocer's shop, went to the local girls' grammar school, and as that then went on to be one of the leaders of the free world. I mean, it's, that's a hell of a legacy for somebody to leave behind. Contrast that, though, with the scenes of jubilation witnessed in the Scottish city of Glasgow, and indeed elsewhere, at the news of Margaret Thatcher's death. Prime Minister Thatcher introduced the controversial poll tax to the UK, and her strident anti-trades union policies made her a hate figure to many. A deep-seated visceral anger which persists to this day. Internationally though, her reputation remains largely intact, and Commonwealth leaders have been paying their tributes. Obviously, Margaret Thatcher and I did not share a political outlook on the world, but as a woman, I am admiring of her achievements becoming the first woman to lead uh, the United Kingdom, the first female Prime Minister there. Margaret Thatcher spent her final weeks as a guest at London's Ritz Hotel. Her body was removed from there early on Tuesday and taken to an undisclosed location. Preparations for the funeral service are already underway, but security will be tight, not just because of the expected attendance of the British royalty and international heads of state, but because so controversial, so divisive is the memory of Margaret Thatcher even now, protests remain highly likely. Margaret Thatcher's funeral will take place here at St Paul's Cathedral in the centre of London. And now we have a date. Next Wednesday, the 17th of April, a ceremonial funeral with military honours for the woman whose name continues to invite criticism and praise in almost equal measure. Paul Brennan, Al Jazeera, London. Well, Margaret Thatcher's supporters say she'll be remembered for revolutionising Britain's financial sector and helping millions get on the property ladder. Yet in some parts of the UK, her death has been marked by street parties and celebrations. Lawrence Lee takes a look now at how she remains such a divisive figure, even in death. At his office in London's most expensive address, Paul Killick has a lot to thank Margaret Thatcher for. For him, her financial reforms, known as the Big Bang, opened up the world of money to anyone smart enough, determined enough to make something of themselves. Private uh, capital had been the only source of, uh, of wealth within the city at that time, and this allowed corporates to start leveraging uh, the stock market and other, uh, uh, other vehicles of that type. So um, it, was, it was truly radical in that sense. A few kilometres south is the London suburb of Brixton. It's an example, say supporters of Thatcher, of her property revolution, which changed the lives of millions. This place is currently on the market for $1.3 million. If you could afford to buy a house here when Thatcher came to power, you'd be a millionaire now. In Brixton, you know, there's a, the, the big scene of the, uh, the riots when the poll tax changes came in. Um, and those are the very same people who, who have benefited. Um, so, yes, I think in some respects, lots of people uh, don't give her the credit for, for what they may have already benefited from. Yet here's where the case for Thatcher gets messy. Brixton hated her. Now, as then, most couldn't afford to buy into the dream she created. As elsewhere, okay. Brixton rioted against her and everything she stood for. To Margaret Thatcher's many admirers, what she really represented was a sort of ultimate expression of social and economic freedom. Buy your own council house, buy your own shares, set up your own business. This was the American dream, really, transplanted onto Britain. How bewildering it must have been for them then that so many people in this country not only rejected that idea, but wanted to burn it down. Opponents of Thatcherite economics argue that she cultivated debt and greed, put the poor at the mercy of the banks, created false bubbles of hope you could still hear popping as recently as 2008, when the financial system she created fell apart. 
when you deregulate finance, when you allow banks to create credit on an absolutely enormous scale. You know, Britain in total is now the most heavily indebted advanced economy anywhere in the world. If you allow banks off the leash, let them run away and do what they want, making new loans, making loans out to everybody, you can keep the economy going like this for a certain period of time, but you've created a bubble. And after, event, after a while, the bubble collapses. And of course, that's what we've seen happen. So in the same place where protesters rioted against the infamous poll tax, now people who weren't even born when she was Prime Minister refer to Thatcher as a witch. In Brixton too, people who felt themselves disenfranchised love to hate her, just as the wealthy will always adore her. Just thank goodness for her. <laughs> Lawrence Lee, Al Jazeera, London. Well, David Owen is a former UK Foreign Secretary. He joins us now in the studio to talk more about Margaret Thatcher's legacy. Thank you so much for joining us. In that report by Lawrence Lee, we saw some of the protests overnight. It was quite interesting that some of the people protesting there looked so young that they probably weren't even born when Margaret Thatcher stood down. Does it surprise you that even decades later she can be so divisive and people can feel so strongly about her? Well, it doesn't surprise me, but I think there is a false image of her uh, it's said that people either loved her or hated her. I never loved her or hated her. I agreed with her on some things. I disagreed strongly with her on others. I respected her, broadly speaking, but her record was one for ideologues. The ideologues love her uh, on the right and the ideologues on the left hate her. But I think majority of people in the country, after all they voted her in three times, had a, a sense of respect for her and she matched in some respects the hour. There was a general feeling when she came in in the early 80s that we had to become more commercial. We had to earn our livings in the markets of the world. And there was also a feeling that trade unions had to be more accountable to their own members. That was, I think, the real legacy of Scargill. Everybody knew he'd refused to have a pitted ballot. He wasn't taking any notice of the vast majority of miners. I guess we should just explain to our audience outside of the UK that you were a member of the Labour Party when you were Foreign Minister and then you moved to a sort of left centrist uh, party so you're never really either far left or, or, or a conservative but if we look at her economic legacy which is what people seem to focus on it's almost as if the country is divided in two in the north in the poorer parts of the country a lot of the mining uh, areas they obviously don't like her in the south that managed to get wealthy they do in your own constituency what did you see? What impact did you see from her economic policies, even back in the 80s? To well, my now? constituency was in the West Country. It was a naval port, so there was uh, great pride over the retaking the Falklands. That was something in which I supported her totally and fully. Although I, to this day, will still feel that if she deployed a submarine, as we had done earlier in 1977, that we could have avoided the invasion. But, but she it? was a good wartime leader, and give her credit for that. But what about the economic policies? Did you the see economic people get wealthier? The economic policies were rough in the West Country as well as in the North. And that is why her legacy is more divisive and she is not given uh, credit on the economy by some people in part because she was very ideological about the economic policy. She did good things in respect to making us more competitive. She did good things in towards uh, emphasizing the market. But there was also an emphasis on get rich quick. There was a sort of feeling we sowed the seeds of what happened in the decade up to the banking crisis in the 2000s. And that's where it's, it's just so strange that Tony Blair did model himself on her in so many respects. You, so that you, in a way they were both of them not part of their parties. Do you think that perhaps if she died before the banking crisis, so before bankers got such a bad name and capitalism mm. along with it uh, in many parts of the world, do you think that we would have seen the demonstrations that we saw no, last I night? I think it's a very good point. I think you're absolutely right that th there is a certain sense, and even amongst the youngers, I see it in my own children, of thinking that she laid the foundations for some of the bonus mentality, the feeling that you were able to just pay yourselves, even if you failed, even if your banks had gone bankrupt. I mean, I think actually she would have very much disapproved of that because she was quite frugal and she had an element in her character that was quite strong on moral hazard. If a bank went wrong, uh, I think she'd feel they and their shareholders should pay the penalty, not, not the general public. Fail in her book properly. Let's focus a little bit on foreign policy.
Pelosi. Now, you were foreign minister just before she came to power. You did a lot of the preliminary work that eventually led to the creation of Zimbabwe, so you know Africa well. Obviously, she gets criticized a lot for, A, never really have imposed sanctions on the apartheid regime, and also for seeing the ANC as a terrorist group. What did you make of her policies there? What was behind it? Well, she did support her foreign secretary over the Lancaster House settlement. Against her previous commitments to Bishop Muzarewa, she became more realistic about a settlement. And that one has some regard in Africa and had some regard from people like uh, the Mozambique president, Michelle. Over South Africa, initially, she seemed to be blind spotted. She wouldn't see that apartheid was an evil and had to be overcome. But Towards the end, she was a factor in persuading, particularly President de Klerk. President Bota was un, un, unpersuadable. He was a completely autocratic prime, uh, president. But um, de Klerk pays tribute to what Margaret Thatcher did. And I think there was some constructive diplomacy with a rather good ambassador, Robin Rennick, down there at the time. But uh, and it's interesting, Mandela speaks well of her. So she was a force for getting the apartheid to come to grips with reality. And sometimes it's easier to, to do that from the right. She persuaded Gorbachev uh, that she was a good, he, he would be a good person to talk to. And she then persuaded Reagan that he should negotiate with Gorbachev. Again, it was easier coming from a figure on the right to persuade Reagan and America with a lot of their anti-Soviet attitudes that you should talk to a Soviet leader. Um, you wrote an article in today's Daily Telegraph here in the UK. It's interesting, you used a word that perhaps doesn't come up a lot when speaking about Margaret Thatcher, and, that, and that's cautious. What did you mean by her being well, cautious? She was, you see. I mean, there was a miners' strike, people forget, in 1981, led by a rather attractive miners' leader, Joe Gormley. She paid up. But she took the lesson that coming up was Arthur Scargill. She prepared for it. She insisted on coal stocks. And then she took him on. Now, some people say you could have settled this. I don't think you could have. I think this was a fight uh, between a ideological left-wing uh, communist, really, leader who was determined to fight power and fight political power. And the two did fight it out, and uh, it was tragic in many of the mining villages, but he led that mining community to destruction. David Owen, former UK Foreign Secretary, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us.